Mavic's helicopter with the Pathfinders on board and they will be over the target due shortly to execute the Pathfinder infiltration, the deployment of the battlefield simulation of the battlefield surveillance resources. This team is commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Laurel Thatcher from the Army Office and he's supported by Sergeant Wuchbar from 44 Parachute Regiment. Take note that this is a simulated Pathfinder infiltration. These members are not from the Pathfinder grouping itself. The Pathfinder grouping are currently committed elsewhere, but our three fallers, most of them are from 44 Parachute Regiment. They're all instructors at the school and therefore they are very much experienced or highly experienced to perform such a uh, demonstration in a close proximity of she the crowd. The you can now step observe right through up this. high step just right below the cloud base, Quite directly to the west. <laughs> and this the is ox Oryx is flying from right to left. They will be uh, turning thanks. in shortly, flying in from the west into the wind, so they can drop slightly behind well, us. The reason is for this, no problem. when you jump out, you need to do up wind of the wind cone to allow the jumpers to keep the, the wind before they turn downwind and land. We call that the wind cone. If you drop them downwind, they may never reach this position. Inside the aircraft, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Laurel Thatcher will also be the dispatcher. So he will do the spotting and make sure that we jump over target. We also have a drop zone safety officer that will deploy smoke to be able to bring these jumpers onto this position. Now normally in combat or in a military uh, tactical situation, the power finders will jump on an unmanned drop zone. Therefore there will be no smoke or medical uh, support available to them. That is why they do uh, their training and their selection is of a very high standard. This infiltration will also be done at night, never during the daytime to ensure the security of the Pathfinder grouping because if they get located by enemy forces, then of course the operation might be compromised. They've now turned in, they're now flying towards our position. I will give you a call when they over target and when they deploy. We can also observe that the second Augusta and the second Oryx and are also moving into the hole. We're still waiting for the BK and then all the helicopters will report in. Yes, there I see the BK, slightly lower also to our western side. All these aircraft are controlled from the onboard command post by Major Sloan. Folks, the Oryx will be entering from the southern side at 9,000 feet with four Pathfinder jumpers. These members are in direct communication with the drop zone safety officer who will give them the wind vectors before jump. In the real world scenario, they will jump without his assistance to infiltrate the theater of operation. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see the Oryx entry. They're about 6,000 feet above ground. Therefore, it will take the three fallers about 20 seconds from exit until they open their canopies. And then they will be landing here in front of us. So there's the Oryx running in. So at this stage, the DZ safety officer will direct the aircraft over target. You'll see shortly also see the smoke to assist the pilot to line up into the wind. And just one correction, there are five members on board as far as we know. Ladies and gentlemen, smoke on the ground by the DZ safety officer. The color of the smoke is not important. Some people will say that when it's green, it's, you can jump. The color is not important. It's the wind direction that's important. The DZ safety officer will give final clearance to the Oryx one minute from the jump. Second smoke going off. The aircraft is now nearly directly above us into the cloud base. And just for your information, it's quite sore. To, to fall through the cloud because you fall into the sharp end of the drop. That is the water drop. Oh. The aircraft is now nearly overhead. <coughs> and I'm not going to be able to see that. Oh, 
exit, exit, exit. Three ballers will now fall. They will accelerate with the eight seconds to about 220 kilometers per hour. And then they will open their parachutes around about 3,500 feet above the ground. Now some people always ask me, do you can three ballers open the parachute, do they go up? No, that is they're not going up. They are just decelerating. Normally that optical illusion is created by the fact that the cameraman that occupies the free faller falls away from the free faller. That's why you get this idea that the free faller is going up. Nothing is going up, everything is going down. Free fall is a stepping stone to high altitude, low opening operations. Hello operations. This is you. If you great, where one jumps out of an aircraft at about 30,000 feet above mean sea level and activate the intro air parachute at 3,000 feet above ground level. Meaning these members are jumping from the highest level and open at the lowest level of the jumping. Ladies and gentlemen, all the parachutes are now safely open. The canopy that they are jumping with is the far find with 300. Uh, 300 means, means that this is a three. Uh, 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 I'm going to square this canopy, which is quite large. Civilian so three four jump is much smaller canopy for higher speed. In the military, it's not about speed, it's getting safely onto the ground. The other reason why our parachutes are so large is because the jumper must also jump, and the starfinder must jump with his personal equipment. Because our job is not to land and congratulate ourselves afterwards, it's actually to be some form of mission. The canopies are also colored light gray to make them less visible, visible in the air. The jumper can manipulate the canopy uh, like an aircraft wing by pulling down on the coffers, which can, uh, the jumper can use to steer itself onto the position. The square canopy or the ram aircraft canopy is designed to land into higher wind conditions, therefore making sure for reduced injuries during the Pathfinder deployment. You can now see the Pathfinder coming in. They will clear the canopy close to the ground to reduce forward speed, increase lift and land safety. The small parachute behind the canopy, that's part of the activation device, smaller parachute. Uh, uses that to pull out the main canopy from the deployment pack. Radical turn oh. close to the ground is prohibited. Give him a hand. A yellow one. You can observe that on his back he's got a second parachute. That is his reserve. The reserve is on the same size as the main canopy because if you're under your reserve, you must still be able to land with your equipment. We do not cut away equipment just because we deploy our reserve canopy. Otherwise, you will be stuck on the ground without weapons, ammunition, and equipment. Second jumper coming in. We've requested the Pathfinder grouping to land slightly apart so everybody can see something. Second jumper coming in and he's clearing. Beautiful. Third jumper coming in, standing by for the flare and he flares. A stand up to prevent injuries, but sometimes things go wrong. You go into half breaks and you just take the land. Uh, number four and number five coming in. These are all instructors from 44 Parachute Regiment. Flaring and landing. Beautiful. Gentlemen, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, give them a big hand. These guys uh, haven't jumped in uh, long yesterday because of the bad weather, but fortunately for you, we can display it to you. Now, when the Pathfinders are on the ground, their mission will be to do reconnaissance, especially on the landing and the dome. Should they be compromised during this stage of the operation, they will cut all the equipment away and they will start with escape and evasion. And of course, the airborne commander will initiate the combat search and rescue plan to retrieve them and get them out of the area. These members will now tactically withdraw or non tactically withdraw back to our position. The commander has now cleared in the Casa 212 aircraft. 
to perform a light cargo drop. You can observe to the south, just uh, on the far side of the Augusta 109, the, uh, the Casa 212 is entering from the south. The aircraft has been cleared in there around about 800 feet above ground and they will proceed to do a cargo drop. On board is members, sorry, of, of members of 101 Air Supply Unit. Uh, they have rigged this pallet for cargo drop. These pallets are the A7A light freight container that can be used to resupply forces on the ground, especially small grouping for small grouping such as the pathfinders. The DZ safety officer is further to your north between the main runway and the taxiway. They will deploy smoke and the pilot will attempt to drop the freight on top of his position. This drop will be controlled from the aircraft but the, the DZ safety officer will clear the aircraft. There's smoke on the ground now. Let's watch what's happening. The Casa 212 is a light cargo transport capable of short takeoffs and landings from unprepared airfields. This aircraft is based at 44 Squadron Air Force Base Water Group. Casa 212 is mainly used in the paratrooping and light cargo delivery role. Other tasks include casualty and medical evacuation to air transport critical patients if required, search and rescue, free fall, Static fall, Telstra, as well as daily normal operations. You can now observe that the rear ramp is open. The grouping is standing by and we command to the pilot. They will push the straight container out. Exit, exit, exit. You can observe that these five light oh, containers, A7A, yeah. yeah, normally the freight is dropped with, with white or colored parachutes <laughs> to make them more visible for the paratroopers hey, during um, uh, the, their landing. Freight will always be dropped first and personnel will be dropped over freight for obvious reasons. That is now the cargo drop. You can observe that the cargo is very quickly onto the ground and the power finders will now receive this equipment to use during the subsequent operations. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now commence with the rest of the battle. You can now observe on your right to the west the Roycott armored vehicle, a vehicle entering the display area. The Roycott is an high mobility platform deployed by the armor core. Um, it is a fully 8x8 armored vehicle, armed, well armed with a 76 high velocity gun. It was designed specifically to take out the, uh, the older uh, um, series of Soviet tanks uh, that we inquire, uh, encountered, such as the T-54 to the T-55 series. These vehicles are well armored over the frontal arc to provide protection. They do wide reconnaissance but they are also highly suited to air provide direct fire support as they will do today. Followed in is also the Mamba armored personnel carrier uh, that will deploy the 81 millimeter mortars that for the direct fire support. The 81 millimeter mortar is deployed by the South African Infantry Corps as a direct, for, uh, direct to provide direct support for the infantry at close range. These weapons are being replaced in the long run by a long range 60 mm mortar that provides better firepower as well as longer range. They will now set up uh, to establish a direct indirect fire support base to support the ground assault. Also to the west is now the four Mambas entering the display area. That is the infantry platoon mounted on their armored personnel carriers. This platoon is uh, from 44 Parachute Regiment, 1 Parachute Battalion. Um, they are commanded by... Um, oh, there's more coming in. Yes. They are commanded by Lieutenant Mapasha, call sign India 49, 1 Parachute Battalion. Now normally our paratroopers do not go into battle by vehicle, we normally jump. But for this display, it just shows that the infantry is multi-purpose. We can basically do anything. We are the grunts, uh, we are the queen of the battlefield, as we all know. They will now form up, turn right, and they will form up in a platoon uh, two-up formation. That means two sections up front. The third vehicle behind them is the platoon commander's vehicle. Uh, they will also deploy the 60 millimeter platform, which is a short-range patrol mortar. And then the fourth vehicle at the back is the section in depth. That is the reserve section. The vehicles will now move forward. 
and they will then start to prepare to give us. The ground commander, in cooperation with the uh, air mission commander, have now cleared in the Hawks. The, air, the Hawks will now do an interdiction strike onto the objective area uh, in preparation for the ground assault. I'll give you the call when the Hawks are inbound. The Mamba armored personnel carrier is not designed to participate in direct contact, uh, contact or combat. They are battlefield taxis. They lack the armor protection as well as the firepower to be able to fight. Therefore, they will drop off the infantry platoon. The infantry platoon will advance and then these vehicles will draw to a Zulu area or um, for empty vehicles where they will remain until call upon to retrieve the platoon. You can observe two sections up front, the platoon commander in the middle with his patrol mortar and then the next sections. We are now waiting the hawk to do the initial strike. In the next you'll be seeing the hawk coming from the northern side, commanded by Major Michael Vermeulen, Colson Paladin, together with him is Captain Isaac Munoshin Kadimeng, navigator. The second hawk is commanded by Major DC Solokodi, Colson Leko, and his back seat is Major General Lancelot Matebula, Chief Director, Post Preparation. Right. Hawks inbound, they are pitching for the attack. They are to the north. Over there. Pitching, fanning, and then they will strike. That's loud. The Hawk Makwan 20 living fighter trainer demonstrated the capabilities of the platform. Gentlemen, from the modern back. 
battlefield, we apply the principle of fire and maneuver or fire and movement. So we will not advance onto an enemy position with our proper or appropriate care as well as ground direct and indirect fire support. So this is to keep losses low. So people always ask the question, how can we advance onto an enemy position and not sustain losses? We need to pepper them to keep their heads down. Own forces oh, commander has now moved his team sport, they are advancing at the wall and they will walk to the objective area to clear the objective area and uh, arrest any live personnel that's still on the ground. At this stage the enemy is probably totally disrupted, unable to fire back and they are easy then to contain and support. Take note that the Roy Falls is still in the overhead position, calling overwatch. They are watching the battlefield and the Hawks are up high inside the camp to provide additional fire support. Own Forces Commander advancing through the objective area. You can observe also that the Commander has pulled forward these vehicles. The 81mm mortars are now redeploying forward, as well as the Roy Cup will be deployed forward to be able to take up positions. There's always a possibility of ground forces after a successful attack to be counter-attacked by own forces or enemy forces and therefore they need to be ready to defend their position after the battle. You can observe that the platoon commander has now placed his people in all-round defense and he will be calling for his vehicles to support them as well as retrieve them to redeploy. And folks, the aircrew in the mission. The Augusta, because of its speed and its small size, is idly to do battlefield reconnaissance. It's a dangerous environment, so these where aircraft are normally protected by a rifle, as of course they also have electronic systems on board to protect the aircraft. So this is the Augusta performing a battlefield reconnaissance mission. will also deliver some smoke. The Raycat can deliver smoke by pumping diesel fuel onto the top of the of the Thank you. 
ground forces are now withdrawn. They will now suit up for your uh, viewing pleasure for the drive past. I think these people did very well. They are my old paratroopers. They are my alma mater. And ladies and gentlemen, they can fight. If you're ever wondering if you can, yes, we can. Right, Augusta unfortunately received enemy fire from the ground. The aircraft has been shot down. The aircraft pilot are now trying to land the aircraft. We've been informed that one of the can be much more complicated. This uh, combat search and rescue package will include appropriate air resources, it will include ground elements that will deploy to the ground to retrieve the pilot, it will include com onboard command post and it will be supported by fixing aircraft as well as the right of attack helicopters to make sure that nobody interferes with the field of the pilot. Sarko, the CSAR commander is now on uh, board of the second of the stuff. That is the short state car. They will now search to take the pilots while he's on the run. commander has located the pilot and he's cleared in the two RX helicopters uh, to be able to deploy the search team. I will call it in when they arrive. The search team comprises out of two uh, force elements, a protection detachment under Captain Leon Alban. They are from 500 Squadron. They are the para-rescue jumpers uh, of the South African Air Force. With them will be the medical team under command of Major Tuvela from 7 Medical Battalion Group and they uh, will be providing medical support. Ladies and gentlemen, you can now notice flying in from the south is the two RX helicopters, on board is the search team and the medical team or the protection grouping with the medical team. They are set up to deploy to the ground by means of fast roping or I say again, repelling. We use the rope work techniques to get uh, groupings on the ground, shoot the helicopter for some reason not be able to land. For example, within an urban setup as well as a jungle setup. The yeah. currently now standing on the, on the steps outside the aircraft, ready to rope down. The CSAR commander has also called in the rifle to launch the right. strikes to keep the opposing forces away from the scale. Here's the two RX is flying from the south.
best members of the bottom provide assistance for others who are descending on the same and providing coverage around the aircraft on the deck on the ground for protective surroundings. Ladies and gentlemen, the scene on the ground is as follows. You can now notice that the injured pilot has been loaded into a basket for hoisting. He is surrounded and protected by members from 500 Squadron, the other members with the black helmets. These members are Air Force personnel. They are all qualified paratroopers and they support us during airborne operations to do combat search and rescue. In the same capacity, they also support special forces. The members with the white helmets are members from 7 Medical Battalion Group. They are fully trained medical personnel up to level uh, medical level 7 to 8. So they are basically paramedics and they will then support or render medical support. You can see now that the stretcher has been relieved. On the stretcher will be the stretcher jockey. You will ride the stretcher to the aircraft and it will be guided by a guide rope to prevent the basket from spinning. Right, we are now waiting for the aircraft for the group on the ground to prepare themselves and for the air mission commander to call in the RX helicopter to start. Yeah. She's not Ladies dead. and gentlemen, you can observe the BK-117 has been called in to do the hoisting and the retrieval of the injured pilot. Kawasaki BK-117 is a light utility helicopter operated by 15 Squadron Charlie Flight based at Air Force Station for Elizabeth in Uh, they will lower a rope 
and the crew, the search grouping, will attach themselves to this rope by means of a carabiner attached to a harness. The second aircraft will fly in, you will notice further to the south, the gecko has been positioned for cargo screening. The gecko is a rapid deployment for vehicle used by the airport. That vehicle can be dropped by parachute from a C-150 aircraft or at a time. The vehicle can also be cargo screened under an RX helicopter and it also fits onto the small landing craft of the SA Navy. We've done tests a couple of years ago very successfully. The vehicle is very suitable to land in the surf because the hull is watertight. And of course, because it's a permanent 8x8 vehicle, it travels over sand like nobody's business. The vehicle weighs about 900 kilograms. It's very light for the purposes of the airport. We are now waiting for the ground command, I say again, the air mission commander, to call in the aircraft for the retrieval. Right, instruction was given, Oryx is inbound to the south, one will do the rope extraction, the second one will do the cargo lifting of the gecko vehicle.